What's up there YouTube, my name is Alex, also known as Inch95, and I'm bringing you guys the very first installment of my book review for Patrick Hoban's uh, Road of the King. I have the book here, and I was going to have him be on this first segment. I did contact Patrick Hoban, as most of you guys know, I did get a reply back. Uh, he was planning on doing this uh, with me, but I'm not really sure when that'll happen, so I'm probably just going to start the series off so I can start getting it to you guys immediately. And uh, hopefully maybe in a couple of these series or maybe one of them in the near future, I can have him come on and discuss that particular section of the book with me or just in general. And uh, yeah, I want to hop right into it because I think so far I've gotten maybe through about like 150, 200 pages of the book. Um, and it's about 500 pages, so there's, there's, there's quite a bit of reading to do. Uh, and I don't have too much time on my hands, but I want to get right into it and talk about the first uh, section, two sections of the book. Uh, pretty much really as a preface to the rest of the book because I think it's really, really important on how he sets up his foundation. And on screen here, you guys will probably see a bunch of different things and I'm going to be talking about them. And I'll, be, I'll, I'll periodically be glancing down at the book because there's a couple sections I highlighted and underlined that I really want to talk about that are really relevant. So uh, we're going to hop right into it. And I think it's really uh, necessary to talk about one of the things that I'm sure a lot of other people are kind of going to dismiss if you have his book or if you've really heard him talking about this before and that's really the overarching concept that he talks about uh, where he gives the example of the blind men and the elephant which is actually what he starts his book off it's a short little story and I've heard it before and essentially it's about the these blind men who each try and touch this elephant and they have different assumptions and interpretations and perception uh, perceptions of this but then when a man who can see the elephant uh, walks by and tells them it's completely different from what they initially believed the elephant to be. And they didn't assume it was an elephant. They touched different parts of it. They, they made all these preconceived notions based on different fallacies and, and, and things that were just very, very skewed. And I think that's really where he builds the foundation of his book for where he's essentially saying, you know, I'm taking a step back and using my own experiences. Not me, but as in himself, he's taking a step back and using his own experiences to kind of shed light on the, the elephant that is Yu-Gi-Oh! Because there's so many different, you know, perceptions and, and uh, misconceptions across the board that people establish about the game. And either, you know, from a lack of experience or just across the board, different fallacies. And that's really what he starts to establish his, um, his I wouldn't say his credibility, but a lot of his ethos that he has in his book. So, um, anyway, so the way that he really begins his, his book in the first two sections, uh, outside of giving that example of the blind men and the elephant is he talks a little bit about competition how you really have to have that drive in competition because really to win is to be excellent and you know it's it's in, it's in our nature to compete as individuals in life and obviously as something as you go and um i, I kind of you know believe it or not just i'll give you guys a little bit of a heads up you know the first you know a couple hundred pages of his book i've noticed and, and actually a majority of it you know are really are really based on philosophical notions and really just beliefs that he establishes and he uses a lot of different quotes, which I really, really like. Before every section, he includes some kind of quote or some kind of uh, some kind of text that he that, or excerpt that he that he took from somewhere, and I really enjoyed that. But as far as what he begins his book with is, he actually critiques another book that's also on a card game. So if you guys have or haven't heard of it, it's called it's called the um, Next Level Magic, and it's a book by Patrick Chapman. Uh, coincidentally, his name's also Patrick. But Patrick Chapman was a magic pro, and he has a book called Next Level Magic where it's really a breakdown of Magic the Gathering, and Patrick Hoban has read that, and I, and I actually have the PDF of Next Level Magic, and I've looked at it as well. And Patrick Chapman makes a ton of good points about card games, and he doesn't really look at it from the subjective point of it just being magic, or Patrick Hoban doesn't really look at it as just being Yu-Gi-Oh! They both kind of, you know, give a really solid uh, and basic understanding of, you know, interpreting the game and use, utilizing all your resources, utilizing your competition, and trying to make the most of what you have to work with. So, uh, Hoban actually goes on to begin his book by introducing something what he calls here on screen, you guys can see it, it's called the Theory of Influence. And I'll quote that for you guys in a little bit, but the Theory of Influence is essentially something that he kind of uh, formulates as something to not really critique, but oppose Patrick Chapman's Theory of Everything. So, in Patrick Chapman's book, Next Level Magic, he kind of talks about the idea of resources in terms of card economy, tempo, uh, the philosophy of fire, which I'm not going to go into detail about every single one th one of those things because it, it's largely irrelevant in comparison to what Patrick talks about or Hoban talks about in his theory of influence. And he really breaks it, breaks the theory of influence down into several different assessments. So I'll quote the guy the the you know the the little passage of what the theory of, of, the, of theory of influence is at the end of this uh, episode. 
But I kind of want to start and talk about how he talks about how first we really have to realize when we're approaching Yu-Gi-Oh! or really any card game that resources are re really limited, just like in anything in life. And we really have to be co be cognizant of the fact that the only real way to utilize those resources is to manage them effectively, uh, be aware that they are limited, but by being able to manipulate them in a variety of different ways, you can accumulate more of them over time, that gives you more and better options, and that will ultimately lead you to having that win. So, uh, we're gonna, and, and one more thing is, and I've talked about this before on my channel, is that all resources are really subject to diminishing marginal returns, and I've talked about that, obviously. There comes a point where if you have too many resources or too many resources of the same thing, eventually it'll start to have a negative impact on you. And that's really an economics term, and I know Patrick Hogan is also a political science major. I'm not sure if he's minored in like English or anything like that, or econ, but I'm a poli science major, so I see the, the theory of diminishing marginal returns quite a bit in my studies, and uh, I kind of appreciated that he, he took that philosophical and, and, and poli sci approach to this. But essentially, he breaks it down to the four areas of influence within his theory of influence, where based on all the resources that we have, there's really only four choices, or what he kind of says, we only really care about the choices within the system of rules that we will use to evaluate these choices. So the system of rules that we have at Yu-Gi-Oh! would be something like tournament policy, uh, the card pool that we have access to that Konami gives us, you know, new card releases, uh, past card releases, etc. Uh, the forbidden and limited list. All those things are essentially the constraints that we have on this game, right? And we really have to look at the things that we can influence. So that's what he really bases this theory of influence off of. So. Uh, the four things that actually exist, not necessarily within his theory of influence, but what he bases it off of predominantly is um, the play that we can make. So in terms of our personal play that we can make throughout a game, uh, our opponent's play, our opponent's decks, and then our decks. So the only real things that we have control over between those four things are our own decks and our own play. And obviously our own play can be broken down into a couple more things, but we're going to get into that. So the four, the four areas of influence that Patrick actually describes and identifies distinctly are the four that you can see on screen, which are technical play, the mental game, deck building, and the metagame. So technical play is really how you utilize your own resources, actually the sequencing of your own cards um, within a given match, within, within a given game. Um, and that obviously includes everything, you know, from the philosophy of fire, tempo, card economy, all those things that includes all those things. And being aware of, you know, the, the, the disadvantages and advantages of correctly utilizing them both in the short run and the long run. So, um, and, and obviously it goes into things like side decking, but that's technical play. And when we go into mental game, that's obviously things like reads, getting reads off your opponent. Uh, giving them false reads, potentially deceiving them into making a play, which I, I'm sure I haven't gotten in any part where he talks about the whole Dijin thing, but I'm sure he will be talking about that uh, very soon. Uh, gauging your opponent's skill, all that stuff really goes in the mental game. Uh, that's kind of an individuality thing, kind of being able to perceive the game, not really so much from a technical standpoint of what's going on within the game, but kind of a, a, more holistically, if that makes sense to you. Deck building is obviously how you build your deck, and then the meta game is really the shaping of the meta, kind of identifying trends in it, and how you can potentially shape the meta. But moving on from that, uh, I think it's really important for me to quote this entire really... I guess, reform text of the theory of everything. So the theory of everything, like I said, is what Patrick Chapin in Next Level Magic identifies as being pretty much everything that's really relevant to Magic or any card game. And Hoban kind of takes a spin on it and rewords it and rephrases it and he comes up with this theory of influence. So I'm going to go ahead and read it to you guys because it's pretty long. It's really this, uh, this giant block of text here. Um, so he goes on to say, so the theory of influence is this. In a tournament, Players within a system of rules make choices that dictate the outcome of the tournament. Developing more and better choices by manipulating the factors influencing the outcome of the tournament with respect to the system of rules, the hierarchical structure of the tournament, so the tournament um, then matches then games, and the limited control uh, so an, an individual can exert is influenced by an individual uh, by other people's play mental game, the individual's deck, deck building, and other players' decks, so the metagame. Studying, exploiting, and improving upon properties of the areas that we can influence are just all parts of the same thing, the option to play the tournament. And I think that was very cleverly written because Patrick Chapin really writes this in a very similar fashion, but he doesn't describe it as something that 
it, every individual player can influence the game by. So, what Pat, Pat is essentially saying here is, there's all these different areas of the game. And you really have to be aware of the things that you can directly impact. And that's really what he breaks this theory of influence down. It's not so much as paying attention to the things that you can't influence. It's more about paying attention to the things that you actually have can, can have a direct impact upon. And I think that's why I really, where I really wanted to break this, um, uh, this first part of this video down. Just because uh, you know, the, the rest of the book, uh, the next couple sections, are a little bit more philosophical and go into biases and things like that. And I'm, I'm a really big fan of those, just being a poli sci student. Um, being able to identify biases, but I'm going to go into that in the next section. This is really the first part of my book breakdown. Uh, I wanted to know if you guys want to see more of this. Uh, I will be going into more detail. Obviously, I can't cover every little piece of text that he says, every little quote, but I think it's uh, it's important to be aware of things. You know, obviously, things like card economy being a quantitative measure. You know, tempo, the way the game is going, uh, being able to gain tempo, losing tempo, as far as when your opponent is ahead in card advantage or you you have that card disadvantage. And I know a lot of these things may seem basic to you, but I think it's really important if you really try to improve your play uh, across the board to really start from scratch and really start to start, you know, relearn everything that you quote unquote already know. And I really appreciate the way that this is written because like I said, I'm a huge fan of philosophical writing and really just interpretations and perceptions and kind of breaking down uh, the whole into the sum of its parts and taking the sum of its parts, trying to reconstruct something again. And... If you guys are interested in seeing more of this, I'd be really glad to do this. I'm really into reading things like this, especially if it's Yu-Gi-Oh! I mean, obviously, uh, things like this really kind of reignite my passion for the game. And uh, there's very few writings like this that you can find outside of DDG. For me, so far, this book, really just the first 150, 250 pages, um, haven't been the most exciting in terms of, you know, from a technical standpoint of the game, in terms of, you know, giving you direct suggestions. But it really... Um, I think it, the most important thing is kind of relearning the game from the most basic foundation of it. So uh, if you guys are interested in seeing this, please let me know in the comment section down below. I'll be sure to do more of these in the future, and I will do my best uh, to hit up Pat again. Uh, you know, like I said, we had a couple small uh, back and forth chats on Facebook, and um, perhaps I can get him on here. Maybe you guys want to go send him a message and uh, tell him to come on here, and we can break down. Uh, a couple sections of this book so uh, yeah the next section that I'll be talking about is probably a lot of the biases that Patrick identifies uh, that a lot of people make as, as far as preconceived notions and incorrectly interpreting the game and how to go about it so uh, I'll see you guys in the next video if you guys know this please drop a like subscribe if you already haven't I'll be sure to do more of this kind of stuff that was my road to the king first section interpretation on the theory of influence if you guys have any questions or you guys want some clarity please comment down below uh, I, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to tell you guys here to get this book because I know a lot of people either don't have the funds or you're too young and you don't have access to PayPal or anything like that. I think I paid like 20 bucks for the book, which, you know, it's a small in investment, if anything. And I just wanted to support Pat, but I thought it'd be a really cool video segment for you guys. So, uh, yeah, peace out, you guys. And um, that's really it. I mean, I will be going uh, into detail in the next couple things. The next section is obviously going to be called the building blocks. So uh, we're going to be going into that. I'll see you guys. And, uh, yeah, it's really all I wanted to cover. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you guys have any suggestions and things you guys want to hit me up on. It's at Inch95. You guys can check me out. Uh, peace out, you guys. And uh, remember, duelists, limits like fears are often just an illusion. I'll see you next time, guys.